Hello and welcome to CD Oasis. My name is Shiraz Gessayer. Today, I welcome once again Dr. Paul Belziki, a dental surgeon from Toronto. By now, most of you know that Dr. Belziki has more than four decades of clinical experience to share with his colleagues on Oasis. He is here today to share yet again another presentation about a perio restorative technique. Dr. Belziki, it's always a pleasure to have you with us. So can you tell our audience what the presentation is about and why did you think that this, imp this information is important to share? Well, the title of this presentation is the Perio Restorative Interface. Now, a good healthy periodontium around healthy teeth is important, uh, whether we're doing restorative or not. And part of that uh, healthy periodontium is a good solid zone of attached gingiva. Now I know that we've got changes coming out with nomenclature, what we're calling these things. I don't want anybody to take me to task on this. I'm 65. I'm still going to use all the old terminology I'm comfortable with. And I hope I don't offend anybody. But a good zone, a nice thick zone of attached gingiva is important to guard against recession, uh, toothbrush abrasion, and things of that sort. And it's even more important when we're doing crown bridge work or even restorations that approach uh, the soft tissue because that's injury. Surgery is nothing more than controlled trauma. And if we're presenting some trauma, we'd like tissue that can cope and handle that. So that's what this presentation is about. Most of the presentations I've done before regarding perio have been subtractive where we needed to take away bone or apically reposition flaps, but this is an additive phase of periodontal surgery. So why I think this is important to present at this time is because uh, I see by email, I'm always inundated now with, uh, with promoters or with promotions, uh, self-appointed gurus and the like uh, of, a, of techniques for developing and dealing with soft tissue defects. And it usually involves allograft material. Now, the people that, I've, that I trust, the periodontists I've trust and respect, have always said, look, there's nothing better than autogenous connective tissue grafting. Because you're taking the, the patient's own tissue, usually harvested from the palate, and you're putting it in a recipient site, and there's a communication. The DNA is the same and it's live tissue, and there's communication between the donor and the recipient site, and this thing matures. It starts itself, and it matures as self, and you get wonderful keratinized epithelium, and that's why it is the gold standard. So I just thought it would be an opportune moment to present this at this time. All right, I'm eager to know more, so shall we go and see the presentation? Yes, we shall. Let's go. Hello, and welcome back, everybody, after the Christmas holidays. I'm wishing you all a prosperous new year, happy and healthy. Uh, today's presentation is titled The Perio Restorative Interface, and we'll be focusing on connective tissue grafting. I know that in the past, when I've spoken about periodontal surgery, it was more had to do with the subtractive aspect of surgery, such as removing a root or removing bone for crown lengthening and apically repositioning flaps and things of that sort. But today we'll be focused on um, the additive aspect of periodontal surgery and that's connective tissue grafting. So for those of you new to the series, let me tell you I'm a restorative dentist and I'm proud to say I still fix teeth. That doesn't mean I only repair and replace broken or decayed tooth structure. I attempt to integrate endo, perio, ortho, and restorative dentistry to deliver expertly crafted restorations on teeth and implants in some cases that are surrounded by a healthy periodontium. We need healthy gums around our teeth and implants because studies will tell us that this will result in long-lasting restorations. And of course, I'm always doing it old school. That doesn't mean I'm stuck in the past. It just means I prefer, after 40 years, to employ methods and materials that have a history of predictable success under peer review analysis. I don't jump on any bandwagon. If something has proved itself uh, successful in the past, I'm inclined to use it and keep on using it. 
I don't need new and improved when I knew that when I know that essentially old will work as well. So let's review uh, a healthy periodontium. And a vital component is an adequate zone of attached keratinized epithelium. And around these two crowns on the 35 and the 36, they're outlined or highlight is the zone of attached keratinized epithelium. And we would love it to be three millimeters or more. We would like it thick, robust, and resilient. Uh, because we know that this sort of tissue is resistant to recession over the long term, toothbrushing and things of that sort. And it's important, it's important to have this complex in place where crowns or bridges or implants are to be placed. So in this case where we're doing the crowns on the 35 and the 36, we have to subject those teeth to trauma. We've got to trim those down as expertly as we can, define our margins, and then we've got a pack retraction cord. And I use a two cord technique. I'll put one cord in initially, and then just before taking the impression, I'll put a second cord in, then remove that second cord and syringe around my impression material. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're doing this digitally, you still have to get it on those margins so you can pick that up if your preferred technique is digital. I'm still using VPS in a custom tray because I want to pick up every detail of that margin. I have to send that information to my laboratory so that they can make their study models and then make me beautiful crowns that have tightly well-adapted margins that I can place these crowns in place and know that nothing will leak and it will stand up to the test of time. So, Doing it old school, using connective tissue grafting, I'll be using autogenous tissue, and that's harvested from the palate. And every time I talk to my periodontal colleagues and I ask them, look, I hear that alloderm is good. What about some of these other uh, donor materials from an, another, uh, another entity other than the person is to be used? And they say, look, Paul, if you're getting good results doing it the way you're doing it with uh, autogenous tissue just keep doing it because that is the gold standard so it's not just my opinion it's the, the opinion of periodontists that, that I trust and here is the armamentarium that I will be using and it's quite simple I've got uh, some tissue pliers a periosteal elevator a needle driver some scissors three scalpels three different types of scalpels and of course local and sometimes I will uh, employ some tetracycline. I'll make a slurry of the tetracycline with the local and just apply it onto the root surface. It seems to uh, open up the surface for the, for the uh, growth of collagen fibers. Don't quote me on anything like this. I'm not a histologist, but um, there's good evidence for using some sort of acidic material on the root surface. Now, one of the scalpels is a special one. It carries two number 15 blades, and uh, they can be two to three millimeters apart. I like the three millimeter uh, distance because sometimes when you're leaning up against the, the vault of the palate, against the bone, it can, it can bend that blade over towards the other blade and narrow down the amount of tissue you're going to harvest. So I like the three millimeter uh, dimension. Now, I just want to say before I start, and I should have said this earlier on, this is not a step-by-step -step how to. I don't think it can be done in the 20 or 30 minutes that this presentation runs. This is just in case those that are unfamiliar with this, how it's done and what it can do for you. If you're contemplating doing this, you have to attend good courses at the university level, uh, or other organizations that will help train you properly. This is not something you pick up and you just run and go with it. So please, this is not a step-by-step. -step. Just for the uninitiated, it lets you know what it's all about. So here we've got uh, some areas of minimally attached gingiva. Uh, this is bridge work that I've done for a patient. This must be about 20 years old. 
And over the years, we've got a little bit of recession here. It's, it's, this is an elderly, elderly gentleman. It, we're not doing this for cosmetic reasons at all. It's just, it's irritated and it bleeds every once in a while. And I want this bridge to last him the rest of his life. So I want to develop some better tissue in this area. So an incision will be made and then it will be dissected down right down to the periosteum. So you have to do some partial th thickness dissection here. You want to get down to the periosteum. You don't want to put tissue on top of movable mucosa. Then you get this postage stamp of epithelium, of keratinized epithelium on movable mucosa, which is totally useless. So you do have to get down to the periosteum, but try not to damage the periosteum. So you measure what you've cut, and then you go to the palate, and here you can see that scalpel with the two number 15 blades. And I'm going to take a bite of tissue along here, make a, a, a pass. And so the, the amount of tissue you can get is dictated uh, a lot by the anatomy of the palate. You have to be able to read that and understand that, and that comes with experience. So here I knew I had a, a wide, a wide palate, uh, good length, so I could take a, a fair bite of tissue, and there it is. I've highlighted where the incision marks are, and you try to get about 20% more than what you've measured if you've done this in millimeters, because when you remove that bit of donor tissue, it will shrink a little bit and collapse a little bit down in size. And you want to err on taking more than taking less the first time because you're going back and trying to pick up a little bit more as a non-starter. So you take a little bit more because it will shrink and if you have to, you can trim some away. And there you can see this is the epithelial aspect, the epithelium out, and that will face away from the periosteum. So that's flip down from the palate, put in the recipient site, and here I've tried to highlight where the epithelium is, and I just tack that into place. I'll get some 3O silk, I'll go through the movable, movable mucosa, through the, gra through the uh, graft material, through the papilla, then come back around and tie it off, and you can see I've done that in two spots, and then it's tucked in. Uh, this is about three weeks post-op, and I often tell the patient, look, it's not going to look all that great at the beginning, but it will mature and give it time. And the patient is instructed, please don't brush the area, don't touch the area, don't pull your lip back and look at it, because there's every chance you could move that little bit of graft material. And there it is four months post-op. And you've developed honest, <laughs> solid, 100%, it's the patient's epithelium. And that's very thick and robust and will withstand toothbrushing and the test of time. So that's four months. That's how we started. And this is how we ended up. And that's a, that's a typical re result. And you know that that tissue is going nowhere. So again, old school, connective tissue grafting. Now, whether um, there are periodontists out there and they're going to take me to task, this isn't really solely 100% connective tissue, you're taking some epithelium and you're leaving some exposed. You could say it's a combined free gingival graft with connective tissue. Um, the f however you want to label it, this is how I do it. And these are the results that I typically get and hope to show you that. So again, connective tissue versus free gingival or combined, I'll leave it up to others to label it. I don't care what it's called. This is an old school technique. It will result in good keratinized epithelium. And again, it remains the gold standard. Regardless of the techniques that we're being bombarded with on the internet, I get them, you get them. Simple, easy, just get our tools, poke the stuff under the skin, and uh, you too can be a periodontist. I don't know if that's the case, um, but this is how I do it. Going back to the palate, we now have to close that wound. And this particular case, this is about the best I've ever done, where I was able to co-opt it. Typically, you can't do that. Um, I mean, that's a once in a lifetime that it, it closed so nicely. Typically, you try to close this up, 
and you'll have a gap here. And one has to be cognizant of the, of the greater palatine artery and blood vessels that run through here. Sometimes you can nick those and they bleed. And initially, the first time it happens, it's a little upsetting. But you can isolate that little arterial and typically tie it off. So I've just got some mattress sutures in through here to try to close that down, knowing I won't co-op the wound. I take a study model. There's the wound. I'll suck down an acetate sheet, and I've just highlighted there so it's more visible for the screen. I'll place some periodontal pack, and I'll just put that on the roof of the mouth, squash it down, and the patient can wear that for the next uh, oh, day or two, however long they need it. And that's, that bit of periodontal pack provides just enough compression to control bleeding. Um, there are times it hasn't happened too often where if I didn't give the patient one of these stents, sometimes they'll foam me later on at night. I wasn't bleeding when I left, but it could be that one of these sutures may erode through one of the small arterioles and you get a bleed and it can be quite upsetting. So if they have these, it does give enough pressure to control the bleeding. So here's another case and again, an inadequate zone of attached gingiva. You can see there's the demarcation zone. Here it's thin, friable. You can see the blood vessels coming through. Um, you know this is very delicate. In the past, uh, people have placed composite resin in these areas as the tissue was starting to recede. Perhaps there were areas of decay or the patient felt sensitivities. But ongoing recession, uh, the margin that is now apical to some of these restorations. So crowns are being planned for the two bicuspids in the molar. There's also uh, heavy res large restorations in the occlusal aspect. So uh, we're placing crowns here. So I know trying to deliver good crowns to try to carve good um, crown preparations with this delicate tissue in place, you know you're try to put retraction cord here and you'll tear the tissue. So I know I've got to do connective tissue grafting here first because I need to develop a stable zone of attached gingiva to cope with any surgical trauma that's a consequence of crown preparation. So I'll just run through this quickly again. There you can see it. I like to incise as I've outlined. I try to leave the papilla as, pos as much as possible. Um, the higher up I can place my graft, the more root coverage I can get. But I'm not hung up on how much root coverage I can get. What I want to do is develop a complex of tissue here that will be resistant to my crown preparation. So incision is made, partial dissection, and here you can see the bone, but there is periosteum on that bone. And once you make a little bit of, of an incision, the tissue just pulled away. And in this case, I wasn't able to grab a large amount of tissue. It would have been nice to have done the cuspid as well, but I knew that uh, given the anatomy of the palate, sometimes two or three teeth is all you can muster. And here you can see I've sutured in, into place. That's the, the uh, donor tissue that's exposed. And the patient is advised, don't touch the area, don't look at the area, just leave it alone, and don't brush it for the next few weeks. I give them some gauze, uh, two by twos with some chlorhexidine. I tell them, soak the gauze and the chlorhexidine if you have to, and just rub the area as gently as possible. Don't go in there and scour, just leave it alone. And they're advised that uh, when you come back, it'll be red, it'll be ugly. And typically, the uglier it looks, the better it'll heal. Now, that's about, oh, a month or so, or two months. Sorry, I missed that. So it's about two months. And you can see it's adapted quite nicely. It's not matured 100% yet. There are little right angles here where the papilla had met the the donor tissue. And after about four months, 
this all started to smoothen out very, very nicely. And this tissue does have the tendency to creep coronally, which is really, really sweet. So now, this is how I started. This is about four months later. And this will greatly facilitate the restorative phase because now I can do my crown preparation knowing that I've got this whole band of tissue I can put cord into here without even thinking. Trying to put cord, well, I'll just go back, trying to put retraction cord in here. Before I start, I'm already sweating. But in this case, it's a no-brainer. And uh, once you've done the periodontal surgery, trust me, you're a lot more delicate and judicious with your crown preparation because you knew what it took to develop that tissue. So doing the perio on your own sometimes makes you a better restorative dentist, as far as I'm concerned. So I've got my impressions in 360. Every detail, there's not a void, there's not an air bubble anywhere because I have to deliver restorations that will maintain and respect the periodontal phase of this case. And there are the three finished crowns. In this case, they were zirconia. Uh, typically, I like porcelain fused to metal, but young female, very concerned about aesthetics, so we went with zirconia. Not my first choice, but it'll last. Now, that same patient, this is that same patient, you can see her recession, this is 2008, her recession is generalized throughout the mouth. And she had crowding and she wanted to go for ortho. And some people will take direction, tell you, you can tell them where to go, how to do it, and some folks like to do things on their own. So she found an orthodontist, uh, a gentleman I respect and I could work with, and ortho was done between after I had placed the three crowns. So ortho was done somewhere uh, between 2008 and 2012. And I had spoken with the orthodontist. I met with the orthodontist. I expressed my concerns about the recession. Whether to do it before or after can be debated. But in this case, the way things played out with the patient, she just wanted to go ahead and get the ortho done and worry about the perio later. It's not a perfect world, and sometimes you have to adapt. So you can see there are concerns, particularly this area right here. I mean, there's a lot of recession that's taken place over the 32. It's, uh, it's very friable, bleeds easily. You just look at it, and it'll bleed. So surgery was done, and you can see the difference between post-op and pre-op this tooth and this tooth. So I've gained some height. Again, if I can gain more height, I will, but that's my, not my overriding concern. I need to have this last for the patient's lifetime. So you can see there the difference before and after. And once the left area was done, it was time to go ahead and do the right side. And you can see the dramatic increase in width of the attached gingiva. So again, the incision, try to leave the papilla. This will serve as the source of blood vessels coming up through this tissue and hopefully up from the periosteum. I could get a good bite of tissue and suture it into place. Again, pick up the mucosa through the through the graft through the papilla looped around and tied off now i couldn't do it that well here she had a frenum that i trimmed away and trying to get this tissue to adapt to this area um, it kept pulling and i just thought i would just tie it off like this and leave it and no perio pack nothing just left it alone don't touch the area and you can see that what's exposed so again, this may not be 100% connective tissue grafting where you would bury it totally, cover it totally with the overlying mucosa. This is a combination of free gingival grafting and connective tissue grafting, and that's how it came back. I've seen this before. 
and I know enough to just leave this alone. This is not dead tissue. This is just tissue that is in, that is in the middle of being revascularized, and it, it will be the scaffold for the ingress of blood vessels and soft tissue. So if you just leave it, and I did in this case, and again, I tell them the, ugly, the uglier it looks, the better it'll heal. Well, this looked really ugly. It kind of frightened me too. But uh, after a few weeks, it started to look a little bit better. And then after three months, uh, looks, looks very, very nice. So by comparison, that's how we, this is how we started. This is how we ended after about three or four months. Uh, some uh, years later, this is 2017. So if we, and I had done surgery in other areas as well throughout the mouth. And you can see that those three crowns that I showed you initially to start this case off are holding up quite nicely. But it's this area I would want to focus in on. This is 2013, three months post-op. This is some four or five years later. And it's this area right here. You can see that uh, this composite resin was not changed. It's the same composite resin restoration. And when I had done the graft three or four months post-op, it was just apical to the margin. And here you can see some four years later, the tissue has actually crept up. And that's the wonderful thing about autogenous connective tissue grafting, is it does have this benefit of migrating or reorganizing and creeping coronally to cover more than what you thought you had. And even the lateral, if you look at the, at the lateral, even the lateral looks better. So it's the patient's own tissue and it adapts quite nicely. So here's another case, correcting recession over existing crowns. I've had not placed these crowns, they were placed by a previous dentist. But yes, the, you know, that wasn't soft, it was just really stained and I thought the crowns could get more life if we could just correct these areas. And even if I wanted to place new crowns, I still had to do the periodontal surgery. So again, flat, uh, partial thickness down to periosteum, take a bite of the palate, donor tissue, and that's sutured into place. That's the epithelium that's exposed. A week or two later, again, it comes back ugly, but it usually heals and granulates in quite nicely over time. So that it was a correction of recession over existing crowns, uh, some three years apart. A small isolated case, some, uh, some recession here. It could be a tooth positional problem where, of course, this, this root cuspid is proud, could be outside of the uh, bony alveolus. Grafting was done here as well. Same concept, epithelium through the graft, through the papilla, and back around. And that's two years post-op. And you can bang on that as hard as you want. It goes nowhere. It doesn't probe. It's as solid as a rock. And that's quite an improvement. So here, we're, let's integrate, as I said before, I try to integrate all the aspects of dentistry. Here we've got restorations that need doing in the anteriors, lower anteriors. She has some toothbrush abrasion, 50-year-old female, uh, very conscientious, and it's hard to keep the plaque and the calculus off of cementum and dentin. It just accretes there. And she's always brushing and trying to clean it off. And we've got some V-shaped defects. But these teeth are good that I don't want to cut them down for crowns, obviously. Um, when I do class five composite restorations here, I don't just put it on the defect. I like to cut a box. I don't like to rely on just bonding. Uh, it's never really worked well for me. I like mechanical retention as well. So I want a small box preparation in these areas. And I'll need to put retraction cord here as well. So I know trying to put retraction cord in these areas, uh, we've got a little bit of a freenum tug. I know over time, it's not going to be well maintained. So 
also very minimal attached gingiva over the roots of the cuspids. So we were going to do connective tissue grafting for this area. Uh, this is the left side was done first. In place and here you can see the left side compared to the right side and this is what I meant by calculus always getting on these surfaces and they were just hard hard to clean for her and for us. So now we repeated the process on the right side. There's the graft sutured into place. That was the part that was exposed. Here it is a few months later. It still needed some remodeling to take place and it will take months and months and months to reach a stable maturation point. And when it did, I came along, put my retraction cord in and carried out four little class uh, five composite resins on these teeth. And a few years later, it's quite stable. Again, you can lean, you can bounce on this with perio probes, nothing happens. I could go in if it was an aesthetic compromise and shave this little bit of ridge away. Didn't bother her and it didn't bother me. It covers her lip. It's covered by her lip, so aesthetics aren't a problem. So I know that this is maintainable over the course of her lifetime. So the restorations were placed after healing. And there you can see it. And finally, um, you know, I say at the beginning, I integrate perio, endo, and restorative dentistry. Like it's just not a, a phrase I pull out of my hat and say, whoop de doo this is what I do. This is how I practice. In this case, we'll, we'll bear that out. Um, composite resins in these teeth, some of them were sensitive in terms of endodontic therapy. Here you can see I don't place resins typically in bicuspids and molars, so this patient came to me with, with some problems. And there you can see it. And of course, we've got, we've got defects over the cuspid and the lateral. So for reasons of sensitivity, endodontics was carried out over the course of time over those three teeth. The bicuspid was restored with a pin retained amalgam core. And for the cuspid and lateral, we're going with cast post and cores. And from another presentation I did, you know I love cast post cores. And so here are those cores for the lateral and cuspid. And they were inserted into place. Now, when I prepare these teeth, I prepared the margin down to the CEJ because I knew I was planning to do connective tissue grafting for the lateral and the cuspid, but I wanted to get a bridge on these teeth. Uh, first, the endos had to be done for sensitivity, and then she wanted a bridge just to get some sort of stability in terms of her bite and form and function. So I prepared down to the CEJ, knowing that I was going to graft and try to close up those defects. So here are the provisionals in place. And of course, you know, I use old school methyl methacrylate powder liquid because I can add to this material. It adds to itself chemically. I can add to it a multiplicity of times because when you're doing crown and bridge on these large cases, if something cracks or breaks, it's easy and effective to repair. And if you want to change your design, and I'll have to change, I'll have to add later here, I can do this with methyl methacrylate powder liquid. So the periodontal surgery was carried out with the provisionals in place. There's the graft material sutured into place. Again, a week or two later, ugly as can be, but it heals nicely. And that's after four, four months of tissue maturation. So I was able to dramatically increase the width and the thickness of the attached gingiva. So comparing post-op to pre-op, you can see what it looked like here and what it looks like now. Now it's a piece of cake. Now it's a piece of cake to do your crown preparation. So I just, from here to here, I just 
added, all I had to do was extend up a little bit and then add some new methyl methacrylate. And there you can see the difference in the anatomy of the attached gingiva. And this was, and by doing this, I was able to optimize the symmetry of the, of the uh, margin from right side to left side. Now, getting back to crown preparation. Now that I have resilient keratinized epithelium, it can cope with, with the surgical trauma of tooth preparation. And as I said before, when it provides periodontal surgery, or if you can see, go, go visit with your periodontist if they, he's doing a case for one of your patients and see what the patient has to go through to get this, this beautiful gingiva. You become more respectful of the soft tissue complex when you do your tooth preparation. So yeah, I can cut down a tooth very, very quickly, but I spend an inordinate amount of time developing these margins that are just tucked under the gingiva. And I try to do this as respectfully as possible because I know what I put the patient through to get him here. And I don't want to disturb that. So having that sort of tissue facilitates accurate impression taking by whatever method. Because you've got to get all the details off to your laboratory because the restorations will back up all the work that was done on the perio, for the perio. So you want every detail captured either by impression material or digitally so that you can get your restorations back that will be accurately fitting. And here, going with one zirconia crown and a PFM bridge from the cuspid, bicuspid back to the molar. And as you know from previous presentations, I like getting everything back in single units where I can try it in and adjust the metal contour if need be. I'll do intraoral solder indexing because for me, I can assure myself that I will get the most accurate fit possible because I've worked so hard to get the tissue just right and there's the completed case a few years later. And there it is in 2017. So it's done quite nicely. This is the original composite resin filling that I guess I should change one day. But the tissue has held up very, very nicely and is going nowhere, as opposed to what we started with. So as I've said before, expertly crafted restorations and a healthy periodontium are codependent. You need one to have the other or maintain the other. So in conclusion, autogenous CT grafting yields predictable results. The quality of mature tissue is unmatched by anything else. It's safe and it's cost effective compared to allograft material. Yes, delicate surgical skills are required, but so is everything else we do in dentistry. There is the drawback of two surgical sites. Yes, I agree. And sometimes you're limited by the amount of tissue that can be harvested at any one time. But the final result is worth the effort, is well worth the effort. The ability to integrate all the various phases of dentistry is indispensable in planning and executing treatment that is comprehensive in scope. You need to envision all the steps required to achieve an optimal outcome even though you're not the person doing each step. If you're not executing each one, you at least have to know what's possible and how it's done. So you can collaborate with specialists that are willing to develop and share a vision of what the optimal outcome is. I know what I want before I start. I know how it's going to look before I start. I have to do that. And that just comes with experience. So long-term success is an interface between expertly crafted restorations and a healthy periodontium. And that's the ultimate goal of good dentistry. And it's doing it old school. And it's the only school as far as I'm concerned. And with that, I thank you for your attention.